For those of you who may not know me, I am Dan Scott, and I wanted to tell uh, my story of how I prepared for and climbed Mount Kilimanjaro in July of 2019 and give you a bit of information on how to prepare the immunizations and medicines you'll need and the amount of money you would spend. Most of all, though, if you've ever thought of going to Mount Kilimanjaro, I, I would encourage you to do so because, as you will see, you can certainly climb Mount Kilimanjaro like we climbed Mount Kilimanjaro all the way to the Uhuru Peak summit at 19,341 feet, the tallest point on the African continent. Our journey included eight days on the mountain itself, and I'll talk a little bit about why uh, that many days. And then afterwards, a four-day safari to relax and see some of the world's most beautiful animal parks. A little bit about myself. Uh, at the time I climbed to Mount Kilimanjaro, I was 62 years old. We climbed in July 2019, and just three months earlier, I had retired after 44 years of uh, service in the Air Force and in the federal government. I was not in the best of shape I could have been, but I was basically healthy. And my high school friend, Martin, had asked me a year before if I wanted to join him and his daughter, Emma, and son, Nolan, on an attempt to climb Mount Kilimanjaro. I said yes, and thus we began the planning. And a little later, my daughter, Lisa, also decided to join us. So in July 2019, the five of us set out on our journey. Mount Kilimanjaro is in the country of Tanzania, which is on the eastern edge of the continent of Africa, along the equator. Kenya is the, ten, uh, the neighbor uh, to the north of Tanzania, and Zaire, shown as the Democratic Republic of Congo on this map, is the neighbor to the west. And Tanzania is known as a friendly country and peaceful. This is a picture of Tanzania, and Mount Kilimanjaro itself is in the red circle. It's right next to Kenya, and the whole area is a national park. On this particular map, you can see the various game reserves to the left of the red circle. And after a climb on the mountain, we toured three of these areas, the Lake Manyara, the Serengeti, and the Ngoro Ngoro Crater. The most important thing to remember about climbing Mount Kilimanjaro is that it's a hike. It may be a tough hike, but you can get all the way to the summit just by hiking. This is not a technical climb. You don't need ropes or crampons or cliff climbing, ice axes or oxygen bottles. It's similar to Mount Fuji. You can walk all the way to the top. The mountain is actually a dormant volcano. The last eruption was over 350,000 years ago. Kilimanjaro is the highest point in Africa at 19,341 feet. And for reference, Mount Ephraim is 29,000 feet, or about two miles higher, while Pikes Peak in Colorado is 14,115 feet, about one mile lower. Kilimanjaro is the highest freestanding mountain in the world, meaning it stands all by itself, and it is not part of a long mountain range such as the Rocky Mountains or the Alps or the Andes. And Kilimanjaro was created by volcanic activity. When you climb, you'll actually go through five distinct ecological zones on the way to the top. And they include the bushland and cultivated zone at the bottom, and then into the rainforest, which we went through, the moorland zone, the Alpine Desert Zone, and finally up top, the inhospitable Arctic Zone. It sits just 205 miles south of the equator, so you can, you can contrast the tropical climate of Tanzania versus the inhospitable Arctic Zone of the summit. And for those of you who are star watchers, it's, you cannot see the North Star from there. Additionally, Kilimanjaro is one of the big seven summits climbed by professional mountain climbers. Uh, this includes, of course, Mount Everest, the Aconcagua in South America, Denali in Alaska, which is the only peak in the United States that is higher than Kilimanjaro, and Elbrus in Europe, and then the Karstens Pyramid in Oceania. It's popular with the hikers and first-time adventurers 
or with experienced mountain climbers and first-time adventurers because it's considered to be the easiest of the seven summits. I'm glad for us that it was uh, that it was that way. And I see that uh, Martin has joined us. He also he was the one that asked me to uh, go on this climb. So welcome, Martin. Okay, hi Dan. Glad to be here. Uh, this is the route that we took. It's a long route. It took eight days. It's called the Limosho route, and it starts actually off the left side of this map on the west side, northwest side of the, uh, of the peak. We then ascend over a period of days, spending the first night in the rainforest, which is also not on this map. And then we ascend quickly to higher altitudes at camps Shira 1 and Shira 2, which are shown on the map. Then on to Barranco and Karanga, and finally Barafu as we make our way up the mountain. So we come around to the south side of the peak, and then we go back up towards the north and towards the top of the mountain. The hike itself is not just a slow climb. You go up, then down, then you're going up again, and back down over various hills and ranges. We took the eight day route because it had the most chance of success. About 90 to 95% of the climbers on this route succeed in getting to the summit. It costs more, of course, for each day more you spend on the mountain. Once we reached the summit, we came down very directly. Right in the middle of your screen there, you can see the arrow pointing down towards Mawika Village. Uh, and that gets us back down from 19,000 feet to about a little bit under 5,000 feet. It took us seven days to get from 7,200 feet to the 19,341 feet at the top, and then just 24 hours to get from there back down to 5,000 feet. Of the 30,000 people who attempt to climb Kilimanjaro each year, only half of them make it to the top. Sometimes it's just bad luck. The weather is so bad, cold, snowy, and windy, you just can't fight through it. Usually, though, altitude sickness causes people to turn back. The key to defeating altitude sickness is to go up the mountain more slowly and give your body time to acclimate to the higher altitudes. Poli poli, the Swahili word, is the watchword for go slow or take it slow or slow down, which we heard quite a bit on our trip. Also, you have to drink plenty of water, about three quarts a day. You get good boots, socks and gloves to keep your feet and hands warm and dry and without blisters, something that's absolutely critical to avoid. On the right side of this, you can see, see the success rates for the various climbing routes. If you take the four to five day route, there's only a 27% chance of success in reaching the summit. And that's the one straight up the mountain. It's primarily due to the onset of altitude sickness. And that, as I said, is the route that we came down. It's an easier walk, but not for the lungs. And since Martin and I were both in our 60s, we wanted to give ourselves the best chance possible to get to the summit. So we opted for the eight-day route to better acclimate to the higher altitudes. It cost more, but it was well worth it. My daughter and I, my daughter Lisa and I, flew from Dallas in Washington, D.C. to Kilimanjaro Airport by way of Ethiopian Air. It's about a 20-hour flight with a few-hour layover in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, where we were greeted by rain. Martin, Nolan, and Emma flew from JFK Airport in New York City to Kilimanjaro on Qatar Airways with a layover in Doha, Qatar. We all arrived in Arusha, Tanzania, at the base of the mountain, a few days early, as we wanted to get the opportunity to rest up after the long flight, get over some jet lag, and then explore the surrounding area. My daughter, Lisa, is on the left, and Martin's daughter, Emma, is on the right. I'd say Lisa was in pretty good shape compared to the rest of us. She was 30 and works at State Department. While in college, Lisa had spent one summer in Rwanda and a second summer in Tanzania already. So she was excited to be back in Tanzania and looking forward to the food and coffee. Emma was the trip planner. She did all the negotiations with the tour companies, uh, which were climbing Kilimanjaro and wildlife safaris. 
These were South African-based companies who had contacts in Tanzania. And I'll just tell you right now that all of this worked perfectly. We had to drop a 10% down payment in January of 2019, and then the remaining 90% in May of 2019, just eight weeks before our trip. And here's a picture of a, a group that Lisa took before our local trip, our first day in Tanzania. Nolan on the left is Martin's son and worked in a New York City in New York City for a research firm. He was 30 at this time and recently engaged. Um, the driver, Raymond, is shown there, and he was going to be our driver for the day. There's me in the middle. Martin is next. He was 64, a physical therapist in Ohio, and he lives on a 40-acre farm there in our hometown. He and I went to high school together, played football there, and Martin has hiked much of the Appalachian Trail over the years. I had always wanted to join him for a hike, and this was my chance. Emma is on the right next to her dad, and she's about 28 and a music school teacher in Connecticut, and she has taught in Madrid and London. She was also engaged at this time, though married by now, and her fiancé was the one that told her about the company Climbing Kilimanjaro that she used to arrange this trip. Lisa, Nolan, and Emma have known each other since they were young kids. The first day, we did an easy hike to a waterfall. Jacob was our guide for this hike. You can see the climate here is bushland and tropical. Emma and Lisa were the expert photographers carrying the good cameras. Martin and I were the slow hikers, so we had our particular expertise. You can see the next slide, Lisa is shown with a chameleon on her hand. It was already changing colors. And as you can see, we did make it to the waterfall that very first day, and it was a beautiful waterfall. After we hiked back, we visited a local coffee plantation, and here's Brother Richard, is, or Dr. Coffee as he called himself, explaining to us how the coffee beans are grown, harvested, and processed. The locals provide the rhythmic singing for us while we are working. And I wish I could have shown a video, but I'm afraid it won't uh, work on WebEx. So uh, there's always some chance to do when you're uh, grinding the coffee. We each get a hand at, at grinding the coffee beans, and we later roast them and enjoyed a hot cup of freshly ground and roasted coffee. Needless to say, we had to buy several pounds of coffee for our trip home. The second day, we explored the drier savanna around Arusha. Uh, which was the city at the base of Kilimanjaro. And here's, you can see Nolan taking a dip in an actually beautiful freshwater aquifer that was literally an oasis in the middle of a desert. And since we uh, enjoyed the water life and the wildlife, it might be a good time to talk to you about shots. Um, here's the list of immunizations that we needed. And when we got to the Kilimanjaro airport, they, we showed our visas and our shot record indicating that we had been vaccinated against yellow fever. Now, technically, since we were from the United States, we did not need this vaccination, but it was highly recommended. However, if our layover, which had only been two hours in Ethiopia, had been six hours or more, we would have had to have been vaccinated. Other shots were highly recommended, and particularly updates on cholera, uh, typhoid fever, and especially the three series of rabies shots, which I had to have before I went. The other shots shown on the slide are all recommended before you travel abroad. Likewise, there's a list of medicines that we carried with me, and all of us had some version of this. My doctor was able to prescribe all of these, and I specifically visited the doctor to review my current prescriptions to, for any altitude adjustments that I would need to make and to get the necessary medications uh, for altitude sickness. And you see on the side here, it's uh, Diamox, which helps treat and prevent the altitude sickness. Then you have to have malaria prevention or malarone is what I carried. Then in case you got a little headache, you had your ibuprofen. You carried a little bit of Imodium for any mild diarrhea. You should have sun and lip screen, obviously, uh, deep for insects, particularly at the lower levels and on the safari. And it's well worth it to treat your clothes with uh, 
antitic like permethrin before you travel to Africa. On the right slide were the things that we would need in case we got severely ill. First is the azithromycin, and uh, that's for severe diarrhea. You know, the Imodium or something will handle the mild diarrhea, but if you've got severe diarrhea and just can't do anything else but that, it's time to take the heavy antibiotic azithromycin. Likewise, as you ascend, uh, some people will suffer cerebral pulmonary edemas, and that is treated with dexamethasone. Uh, when I went down to get my shots, they spent quite a bit of time talking to me how to recognize the sign of a pulmonary cerebral edema. Now, you may have heard about these, uh, these two pills, azithromycin and dexamethasone. Um, in the beginning part of uh, the COVID-19 epidemic, you heard about azithromycin as a possible treatment as well as dexamethasone. And if you've been paying attention to the news the last few weeks, You'll note that uh, President Trump took dexamethasone when he, he was admitted to the hospital a couple of weeks ago. What we were told basically is if we suffered from the severe diarrhea or got an edema, uh, we'd be taken off the mountain very quickly. We'd, uh, we'd finish our kind of orientation and uh, acclimat acclimatization at the bottom of the mountain, so Lisa and I packed our bags. You could take one waterproof bag with you with no more than 35 pounds, usually with dry clothes, and any extra batteries or something you might need. And the porters would carry that up each day. You could also carry a backpack, and you can see it under the window there that Lisa's backpack by the chair. <clears throat> but they recommended to keep it at about 15 to 20 pounds. On day one of our climb, we were picked up at our hotel and we rode for about three hours to the western side of the mountain, entering at the Lamosho Gate. These gates were signs, uh, were, these gate signs were at each major entry point and camp along the trail, and I'll show you as we make our progress up the mountain. At this point, we were 2,100 meters, or about 6,890 feet. The sign clearly points out the distance ahead. To get to the top, it's going to be 48 kilometer hike. Will take a total time of about 34 hours. Of course, that's 48 kilometers uphill, and uh, we knew from the beginning that we were going to be slow walkers. <laughs> and also, we stopped and we teamed up with uh, Gregoire Robin, who's from France. He was our sixth hiker. Greg joined us as a single hiker. Uh, M and I had agreed up front with the tour company that a group could, could be combined with other groups if needed or someone else could join us. And Greg, a crew member on the airline United Arab Emirates, had always wanted to climb Kilimanjaro. He had a couple of weeks off between flights, so at the last minute he flew in and he joined our group. And we could not have asked for a better climbing partner. He was 35, spoke perfect English, French, and probably a few other languages, was very friendly and quite positive and came well equipped with gadgets, cameras, and chocolate. Greg had been a computer graphics designer in Canada, and then he decided to go to the airlines. He currently lives in Dubai in the United Arab Emirates. Before we headed out, we had a lunch of fried chicken, and then David, our head guide, registers, registered us all for the climb up the mountain. We took a quick bus ride for the first gate, the Londorosa gate, to meet up with the porters and actually begin our walk. We are now at 7,380 feet. We meet up with the porters and our guides. We already met our head guide the day before, but now we had the chance to meet the whole team. In all, there were three guides, one cook, an assistant cook, and 16 porters, 21 people in support of the six of us. It was quite a team. Most of them were from the Wachaga tribe, which had migrated into the area from Kenya about 900 years ago. The Maasai tribe, also from Kenya, which is better known, perhaps, arrived in Tanzania in the 1600s, around the time the Americas were being colonized. This is a picture of our head guide, David, in the middle, with the group before we begin the hike up. 
David was an experienced climber with dozens of trips to the summit. He was 40 years old, very friendly, quite disciplined, and an outstanding leader. Here's Martin telling David, the head guide, and Michael, another guide, how excited he is to begin the journey. So we start out on this nice, easy, marked trail. Then we take a quick break to adjust our packs and check our gear, tighten up our boots. We will meet other groups along the way, such as those that are intermingled here, and you're never alone on the mountain. There are literally hundreds of other people beginning to walk up Kilimanjaro on this same day as us with all their porters and guides, and the day before that, and the day after us. So over the next week, we take turns passing these groups, and we get to know a few along the way, such as a 72-year-old Australian mountain climber who is leading a charge or a large team of Australians up to the summit. And we also met a group of just a married couple from the Netherlands. We met small groups and large groups, both young and old. After a short hike, only about four miles, we arrived at our first camp in Kubwa, also called the Forest Camp. This was an easy shakedown hike. As you see, we looked in uh, pretty good shape here. We hiked from about 1.30 in the afternoon till 5 p.m. We're now at uh, 2,650 meters or 8,700 feet high. We only have 11,000 more feet to go. David, our guide, has been evaluating us, checking out our packs, our pace, and our personalities. He concludes that we are a slow group, which he says is fine. Poly poly, go slow, easy does it, and we will make it to the top, he says. We look very refreshed and quite confident here. It's in this camp that we got to listen to the porters sing us some songs and try to teach us some of those songs. And they named us the Simba Group. Now, Lisa and Emma were well-versed in all the Lion King movie terminology. And I wish I had paid closer attention to that movie when I saw it years ago. The head guide, David, did give us some feedback. He recommended that uh, I double my dose of the Diamox to prevent altitude sickness, and he gave me the necessary extra pills. Same for Lisa and Emma. He also reminded us to stop, not to stop taking the Diamox once we'd started until we were well off the mountain and to make sure we took our malaria pills as well. Now, the thing about Diamox and the malaria pills is it does cause you to have some very vivid and very weird dreams. David also tells me he's concerned my pack is too heavy, so I lighten it up that night. The second day we head out, you see some vegetation here. We're just starting to get above the rainforest and ending into the moorland ecological zone. Martin and I keep ascending. It's another beautiful day to hike. And as you can see, we aren't wearing any uh, gloves or coats. Still, we get pretty hired walking up to Shearer Camp, a Shearer One Camp. So I thought it'd be a good time at this point to talk a little bit about how we prepared to hike, or at least how I prepared to hike the Mount Kilimanjaro. The tour company had set out a hiking preparation guide, and I loaded that up on the website if you wanted to download it. Basically, they just recommend you do some good walks every day, carrying a small 15 to 20 pound pack in your back, and try to prepare for hiking 8 to 10 miles a day at the most, and do a few strength exercises. You can see what I did here on the left, and I really only had about three months to prepare, which wasn't a lot of time. My real goal on preparing was to not do too much and to make sure I did not hurt myself before I got on the mountains and particularly injure my knees. That worked out pretty well for me. Though I could have been in better shape, I knew that by going slow, I would be able to climb. My biggest concern was getting wet and cold. And I made sure I brought good waterproof boots, I had good gloves, the right layers of clothing to keep myself warm. I used REI, the, the store assistance to help me get the right gear and the right wool layers, and a flannel jacket and a waterproof rain jacket. The cool tour company also had sent us a list of items to purchase before we came, things like trekking poles and a pulse oximeter to measure your oxygen level, some hand warmers, a solar charger for charging up your phone, and a good headlamp for the final climb. Also make sure you get waterproof bags to keep your clothes dry. I forgot to take a scarf 
which would have been immensely helpful, helpful on that final climb. Everyone else had one, though. The tents and the sleeping bags and all the equipment were all provided by the tour company, and we just rented the sleeping bags uh, from them. At the end of day two, we made it to Shira One Camp, about 3,610 meters, or 11,844 feet. So we're getting up there. It was colder and foggy at this point, but we were still within the tree line. We had climbed 3,100 feet up that day. In the Air Force, any time you're above 10,000 feet, you're supposed to be on oxygen. We, of course, did not carry any oxygen, and the idea is we would go slow and acclimate to the less oxygen levels. Now here's a picture of that first night. We looked ahead at uh, at the peak on Mount Kilimanjaro and realized we've got a long ways to go. There's still a little bit of snow on the mountain, and David, our guide, told us that the previous week's group had hit a storm on the way up to the top, making it difficult for them to get there. He is hoping and predicting that we will have good weather. There was telephone reception on the mountain, though it was quite spotty. We could send phone text messages each day, and occasionally a picture could get through the weak signal. Lisa and I had T-Mobile on our phones, and we could get the signal. During our few hours layover in Ethiopia was the only time that we could not get a signal. My experience with T-Mobile has been that it's good in Canada and Paris and London and Ottawa and a lot of other places. Martin, Ali, and Emma had different service providers, and they ended up getting SIM cards during our first day in Tanzania, uh, and sometimes they could connect on the mountain as well. David, the head guide, had better connectivity, and he could usually get a signal when we could not. He would set up a hotspot and camp for an hour or so, and we would connect to him to send out updates to our families. Additionally, David and the tour company posted updates of our progress on Facebook, which some of you may have seen as we went along the way. I never did get a text sent out on the first night from the forest camp, but on day two, I wrote, tough hike, I am tired. We got to camp about 3 p.m., two hours slow. We go very slow. Lisa is doing very well. Only about five miles long, but 3,000 feet up. The trouble is you go up a steep hill and then down its other side, and then you climb up the next hill even further up. The food has been great, weather good, no rain so far. That was my first update I was able to send out. There's a great picture of a uh, dinner, and I think this would be a good place to discuss how we ate on the mountain. And what I'd say up front is that we were well fed and fed often. The food was always hot, well prepared, and very tasty. For breakfast, we would eat in a tent, family style, and you'd usually have an oatmeal. Uh, millet was the kind that we had. We'd have eggs and toast, some fruit oranges or bananas, for example, and usually a meat of some kind. Tea and coffee were always available, and we had real plates and real silverware for each meal. Lisa particularly enjoyed the many Tanzanian dishes, as, we had, as she had good memories of her previous time in Tanzania. Now, here's a picture of a typical Tanzanian dish called chips mayai, which I probably massacred the pronunciation has eggs, potatoes, and a variety of vegetables, and it was quite delicious. We always had a hot soup and for lunch and dinner and a frittata or pasta of some type, always warm and always tasty. Dinner would also be a casserole or frittata, always with beef or chicken, and I wish I could name all the dishes, and I tried to keep a record, but it was just too hard to capture all the names of different dishes. Along the way, I jotted down notes like spaghetti, French toast, carrot soup, avocado salad, fried bananas, chicken sauce over rice. Afrikan was our server, one of our team of 21, and he always made sure we had enough to eat. He refilled our water and kept us supplied with hot water and coffee. He was very tentative, very friendly, and always very humorous. Now, dinner was usually our social time when we could talk. Out on the trail, we to walk in single files, or at least we were supposed to, and we had to save our breath. At dinner time, though, we could talk about the day and have some fun. So I'll see the Martin or Emma would read stories from a book on African fables, just a chance for us to get to know some of the culture in Tanzania. 
And of course, the higher up you go, the less pressure there is. And as Lisa opened up uh, some uh, powdered creamer, it exploded on her, and Emma caught this moment perfectly. As you can see, the, uh, the dust all over Lisa. On day three of our hike, we prepared to head out to share a two camp. As you can see, Lisa's ready to go. Nolan is uh, always ready to go. And I'm already on the trail because I'm slow and I take longer to get up there. This is a picture of one of our guides, Good Luck, as he's uh, getting ready to join us. And Good Luck was usually the person who would take my pack near the end of the day as I tired and got slower. Now, David, the head guide, would usually say something like, Hey, Dan, would you like me to take your pack? And I would decline, and a little while, a little while he would say, Good luck, take Dan's pack. David always knew when I was tiring out, and even before I did. He was very observant with how each of us handled the mountain, how we breathed, and how our steps were going. Now, here we are in a single file, making our way up the trail. Michael, the guide, would be in front setting the pace, usually a pretty good pace. David in the middle of us, always observing, and good luck bringing up the rear. Of course, we took many breaks on the mountain. And here you see everyone reapplying sunscreen. Notice the uh, hat, the particular hat that uh, Greg had. Uh, it was pretty hot, and the sun was pretty direct when we were up there. And at this point, we're shedding layers as it has warmed up quickly from the cold in the morning. This is a good picture of Martin with his, his hat. Uh, one of the cactus and flowers along the way. This particular cactus is called the Dendrosynechio Kilimanjari, and we can see hundreds of these along the way. Uh, we're still in the, in the moorland ecological zone, and you can see this kind of vegetation. Finally, later in the day, we arrive at uh, Share 2 Camp, still a pretty good-looking day. It's now 3,850 meters, or about 12,630 feet. So we're getting up there. Lisa and Emma are cold, and I am a little bit cold. I'm also feeling some tingling in my fingers at this point, early signs of altitude sickness. I basically feel okay, but I might have, at night, if I have to get up to go to the bathroom, I have to make sure I do it slowly. Otherwise, I get really dizzy if I sit up right away. At this point, I was feeling a bit queasy as well, with some mild diarrhea. I took an emodium, and then the next morning, Greg gave me some ginger drops in my water. The ginger drops worked like a charm. Greg, in his magic bag, he supplied me with drops every day of the trip, and I never had any more issues with diarrhea. Lisa also took good care of me, giving me electrolyte chews and carrying my camera when it appeared I was slowing down too much. My text message home from this camp was, day three, still no signal, easier hike, now up to 12,800 feet. I still get tired after five to six hours, and the porters are very helpful. The weather was gorgeous. We had a tent shower this afternoon. That felt good to wash the face, hands, and arms. We have a long, difficult hike tomorrow, many hills to get us up to 4,600 meters, and then back down to 3,900 meters to sleep. I don't think I will carry any pack tomorrow. We get up the next morning, ready to go. Actually, this is still the evening. We're taking a rest here at Shira 2. Here's a picture of Greg looking back down the mountain. And a picture of Lisa, and this is looking up the mountain. On day four, we knew this was going to be a tough climb. Because first, we had to go up to near 15,000 feet to a place called the Lava Tower, which was 2,500 feet above where we were now. The point was to ascend rapidly to a higher altitude and allow the guides to see how we handled it. We would stay a while there, have lunch, and then ascend back down to 3,900 meters, where we would spend the night at the Barranco Camp. And on this particular slide, you can see some of the porters heading out here, and notice the trail winding its way up the mountain. Uh, you can see the, the trail actually in the top center left side of the, of the slide there. We're also above the tree line at this point, clearly in the alpine desert zone. Vegetation is scarce, and the porters always move faster than we do. 
I remember one passing me quickly carrying dozens of eggs on his head. And I was still amazed every day we had fresh eggs. I just don't know how they made it up the mountain without getting broken. So I wasn't mad, but there were a few women porters that passed us along the way that were part of uh, other teams. Of course, we took breaks along the way. And here you see Martin and I taking a break, uh, looking out across the valley below us. At about noon, we arrive at the Lava Tower Hut, which is 4,600 meters high, about 15,000 feet. So at this point, we're higher than Pike's Peak. It's cold, but dry, and Emma said she was very cold at this point. We're clearly now in the Alpine Desert Ecological Zone. We stayed a bit at uh, Lava Point to acclimatize ourselves. We even had an outdoor lunch all designed to help us acclimate to the high altitude. It's about the only time we actually ate outside without the tent. After a few hours just hanging around there, we made our way back down to the mountain to Bronco Camp. Arriving there late afternoon, back down to 3,900 meters, about 12,800 feet, again below the level of Pikes Peak, and back into the moorland ecological zone. Climbing high, then retreating to a low altitude to sleep helps the body adjust to the altitude. And this is one of the reasons we took the eight-day route. It also gave our guides time to assess how we were going to do at these higher altitudes. Now, Barranco Camp was cloudy, foggy, and cold, and there was a breeze here. The sign, sign on this slide reminds hikers that if the altitude sickness is getting the best of you, it's time to reconsider. And it says things like, do not push yourself to higher altitudes if you have breathing problems, persistent headache, or any severe mountain sickness. The local guys and park rangers are well aware of mountain hiking risks. Please follow their advice. We all love the mountain. Let us make climbing safe by considering descending as a better option. My text that night was we made it to Barocco Camp, 12,800 feet. The first we climbed up brought our 15,000 feet, and an acclimatization hike with some lunch of stew and toast. We descended through a very steep, rocky, and slippery desert, and the cacti and blooms are gorgeous. We can't send pictures here, but we took many. Poly poly is still the phrase, and we are very, very slow, and we, uh, our guys are telling us that Team Simba is setting the record for going slow. Tomorrow is a four-mile hike. I love ups and downs, and David, the head guide, tells me when to give my pack to the porters. I carried it most of the way, but David can still tell when I'm tiring. We cannot sing enough praise to the guides, porters, and cooks. Now, here's a picture. Uh, Raven kept, or Emma kept taking pictures of ravens. It would seem like they followed us, the same ones followed us all the way up the mountains. Kind of an omen for us. Day five, though, not deterred by the ravens, we head out to make our way to Karanga Camp. And as you can see, it is another cold day, and Lisa is dressed warmly for the hike. Later on, it warms up, and Emma is enjoying a quick break. We do make it to Karanga Camp after just a few hours. It's about 4,000 meters or 13,100 feet high. It's cod covered in cold. However, the short, uh, about three and a half mile hike seems short, although it's still a tough walk. We first climbed to 12,800 feet, then descended another 600 feet, and then back up 400 feet, and then down again, and then back up to reach the camp. So it was quite uh, a tiring and grinding climb. My text home was, um, great frittata and carrot soup for lunch. We have a long, warm afternoon to rest. Everyone is doing well. We took towel baths with a bowl of hot water. And when Africa on the lunch server says, you all must ba bathe now, no excuses, that probably means it was time to wash up. We had scaled up the breach wall cliff for about 1,000 feet. The guidance was, climb like the baboons. Use both hands and feet. Don't look down. I thought it was a lot of fun. I'm not sure that Emma liked it. Greg picked up a lot of mineral rocks to polish later. We did get a good rest at Karanga Camp, 
and tomorrow we have 2,000 feet to get up to the base camp of Barafu. Now here's David. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't get a good good picture of the evening tent. But every night, David would come into our tent and join us after dinner to see how we were doing. He would give us feedback on that day's climb and talk about the climb the coming day. Additionally, he kept notes on our health. Each night, he would use a pulse oximeter to measure our pulse and oxygen levels. At this point, we were already down to the high 80s, you know, 85 to 88% range. He said anything below 80% would be concerning, and if we got down to the 60% range, we would need to come off the mountain. He also checked to see if we had taken our Diamox and malaria pills to see if we had any tingling and headaches and nausea, vomiting, or diarrhea, and asked about any blisters or injuries. He also made sure that we went to the bathroom every day. It was one of his, uh, his biggest points to make sure that we are uh, we were healthy enough to continue the climb. You can see you know, we're getting some ginger drops from Greg again. We're huddled in the dinner tent waiting for dinner. Here's Lisa and Greg enjoying game cards as we wait around for some dinner. And what I wanted to do at this point, I'm going to and this is a picture of a typical campsite for where we were. Our porters would carry the two-person pup tents up the mountain. They would tear down the tents while we ate breakfast, then head up the mountain. By the time we got the camp to the campsites, our tents would be set up, the sleeping bags would be in them, and our ba all our bags were inside. There were six of us in the, in the group, uh, but we had four tents. That meant that each night, two of us could sleep by ourselves. The other four would share a tent in pairs. We decided on the first day that we would rotate each night and take turns getting a night by ourselves. Of course, the higher up you got, the colder a single tent was. Every night we had a different tent mate, and it was fun, and it also meant we did not get too frustrated with the same tent mate every night. The campsites were pretty rugged. Rocks were everywhere, as you can see. But the tents kept us dry and warm and out of the wind. And here you can see a neighboring campsite underneath the Kilimanjaro summit, which is getting closer but still seems quite far away. Now here's a picture of one of our tents with its front flap. You had room for your boots and bags inside, but you did have to crawl into the tent. We noticed that a few campsites were more luxurious. For more than a doubling of the price, you could go on an REI tour and get a large stand-up tent with a cot. Uh, but we were perfectly warm and comfortable in our tents and we didn't have any trouble sleeping. Here's a picture of Lisa and Martin outside a tent with Greg sitting inside. And as you can see, there's plenty of room in the tent. Uh, here's Lisa sleeping here with the bags next to her. And I couldn't go on without talking about the campground chemical toilet with its own tent. I can tell you that it was worth the $50 each we had to pay to have the porters carry this toilet up the mountain. It was like any campground or camping uh, chemical toilet that you would buy here in the States. Uh, but you could walk to it at night, have some privacy, and sit on a toilet. Otherwise, we would have had to walk a long way to the campsite toilets, which were just holes in a hut. Our chemical toilet was much nicer, and I'm sure we all appreciated it. The porters slept in a bigger tent altogether. They had, actually had a couple of them. In here, you can see them huddled up on the rock, checking their cell phones. On that particular day, this was where the signal was. We didn't have any signal down at our level. We're pretty high up, basically above the cloud layer, so we really could not see much below us. At the base of the mountain would have been the city of Arusha, but we literally could not see it, nor the, the lights of it in the, at night. The summit is getting closer but it still seems far away to us. This is a view of it in the morning as we headed out on day six. On day six, we'll do a short two mile hike from Karaga Camp to Barafu, the base camp for the climb to the summit. No matter which way you come up the mountain, everyone ends up at Barafu to prepare for the ascent. It's a steep climb and a rocky path as it shows in this picture. 
We get a late start, unfortunately. Our cook, who goes by the name of January, had taken ill. He needed to be evacuated off the mountain. David arranged for the evacuees uh, for the evacuation to the hospital. He also arranged for Cook, that was already on the mountain, to remain behind at the next camp uh, so that he could cook our dinner that night. As we head out of camp, we hear the helicopter come in to take January down to the hospital. And it's comforting to know that David takes care of his team so well and that the tour company pays for a helicopter evacuation. January suffered from appendicitis. As you can see, this is a good picture of the trail. There's a lot of people on this trail, and it's, uh, again, above the tree line and uh, quite a long ways uh, across the ridge of the mountain here. And, of course, Martin with our guide, Mike, on break along the way, enjoying some of the scenery. We do make it to Barafu Camp, and the day has been absolutely wonderful. We are now at 4,673 meters, or about 15,330 feet. And as you can see by how we were dressed, the weather was quite nice. We were extremely lucky that day. Our goal was to rest up, get an early dinner, go to bed, and try to get four to five hours of sleep. We'll wake up a little bit around 11, prepare for a climb, and then begin the climb. It's a full moon night, and the weather will be clear, David said, but also very cold. We have to climb up 4,000 feet from here to get to the summit, and it's about a three-mile distance. It's the steepest and highest climb of the trip, as shown by the rocky hill in this picture. I wish we could have gone up further, to stayed up further up the mountain, but if the oxygen level is as low as they are, you really can't spend too much time up at this level. My text that evening was we had a short three-hour hike to the base camp, it's very warm today and sunny. We'll have lunch, sleep, dinner, and then get up at 11 p.m. to begin our climb using our headlamps. Temps will be down to below zero. We chatted with a group that just came down who said it was not windy, just a little cold, but no fog or clouds. The whole team is feeling good, and we do have a full moon tonight. Unfortunately, we didn't take pictures on our way up the mountain here because it was just too cold and too dark. So I took one off uh, of another group, and you can see a typical scene of climbing up these rocks, and then behind you, you see lights right in the middle of the picture. That's teams that would be behind us. Um, if you look up the mountain, as the sun was rising, you can see some of the snow, and you see the peak. But you can still see how difficult a climb it was uh, with the, the rocks and kind of the zigzagging trails. And I don't have pictures to go with this. I did jot down notes the next day, and I'd like to go through those a little bit to kind of give you an idea of how we made it up uh, the mountain. So it's day seven, summit climb, I titled it. 10.30 p.m. wake-up call by David. We put on layers, fill up water. Cold water is better than hot. At 11 p.m., we have tea and digestive biscuits, essentially a hard tack, to lengthen the time the biscuits are in your stomach. At 11.30 p.m., the headlamps are on. We start the climb, around 4,500 feet up to go, with the last 500 feet being the toughest. We're at the bottom of three camps on the Barafu Plateau. David, the head guide, will set the pace. He has always monitored us from behind to see our strengths and needs. He dictates the order. I am the weakest climber, so I am right behind him, he says. He tells me he will set the pace based on my reading. It is a steep climb, and a poly poly pace will be the rule. Breaks will be infrequent and short. It's too cold to stop for more than two or three minutes. The muscles will cramp, and breathing will become harder. Martin is next in line, then Nolan, Emma, Greg, and finally Lisa at the end. This order changes about four hours later. The strongest hikers are in the rear. One foot apart, hand on the shoulder of the person in front of you, is how we start out. It takes us an hour to walk through the two lower camps. Some groups are ahead of us, but most are just waking up. Despite the full moon, the path is so rocky you need your headlamps to know where to step. If you look up, you see a small line of headlamps shining, small groups in tight line formations in front of us. 
stay in line had been David's gentle admonishment for over, to us for over the last six days. He was training us for this moment. In a tight line, heel to toe, one foot apart. The lights up ahead of us foretold a very steep climb. It was better to keep your eyes on the rocks at your feet. Looking up was distressing, and it also tended to make you dizzy. We pass through the second camp now and begin a very steep climb. I feel good, warmer than expected. On my feet, I have one pair of liner socks, then a light smart wool pair, then a very heavy pair of wool socks. I loosen the strings to make sure I can wiggle my toes for warmth. My feet feel good. I have not had any blisters yet. On my legs, I'm wearing my boxer shorts, an inner layer of polyester long johns, two wool middle layers, then my hiking pants, then the rain pants for wind protection. I do not feel too constricted despite all of this, and my legs are warm, and they have to be because they're going to be the locomoting of this ascent. On my chest, I'm wearing a polyester and spandex inner layer, then a stretched middle wool layer, then a heavier medium wool top, then my heavy fleece jacket, followed by the down jacket as a windbreaker, and finally the rain jacket. Of course, there isn't any rain, and the night is clear, but it's still very, very cold. On my head, I have a wool cap, followed by a balaclava to cover the, the neck with the headlamp strapped around the top of that. I should have had a scarf, as I had mentioned, which I had forgotten to bring. All I'm wearing is thin wool gloves to start. My heavy mittens are in the day pack in my in the back, as I brought, also brought along thermal hand warmers in case I would need them. I had been more worried about cold and altitude sickness, and I figured that the Diamox and the acclimatization hike would take care of the altitude sickness. My body would either adapt to that or would not, and I couldn't control for it by this point. I could prepare for the cold, though, and I dressed that way. I was warm and not too entangled, and it felt good to be warm. We continued to climb slowly in line, a short break for water. I had a good aerobic pace, or uh, a pulse as I measured around 135 beats per minute, which I could easily sustain for quite a period of time. Suddenly, at about 1,000 feet up, we arrived at the higher camp. It was flat, the tents were lined up military style, and all brightly lit on the inside. This was a completely different level of camping. Bigger tents, lights, flat sites, big mess tents. I thought of that expensive $6,000 REI tour. Several groups were ahead of us. Some were forming up, but again, most were still in their tents. David, the guide, had made us leave early, knowing we were slow and needed the extra time to get there. And he was right. As we walked out of that camp, it began an even steeper ascent, always zigzagging up. I looked back to a trail of headlamps. There were far, far more groups behind us than ahead of us. Small steps, six inches, always up, always forward, eyes down, do not look up. Zigzag six feet, climb up small rock. Turn, zigzag the other way. We catch up to a larger group in front of us, and David tries to pass, but the trail was too narrow. He diverts to a second trail, and we again attempt to pass. We outflank that group and begin to cut in front, and they are not very pleased. Unfortunately for them, a woman suddenly gets sick and goes down in line, and that group has to pull off the trail to rest. David marches us past, and we go on up the hill. Hour three, the porter Ema takes my pack. Martin is breathing harder, swallowing the dust. Volcanic dust is everywhere. Martin wants to take a break, and we step off the path, and we break for three minutes for water. The group we passed walks in front of us again. David says, rise up. You cannot rest too long because the cold will creep in. Up, up we go, in line, forward, zigzagging up another 1,000 feet. The other group was pulled off to rest again. We pass them silently, and we're in front again where we will remain for the rest of the climb. I realize that we really don't have the strength or energy to divert to do anything else. At this point, we begin to run across a few single hikers being helped by, par by porters back down the hill. Most have obviously gotten sick, 
and the porters are not wearing gloves for some reason. I still do not know how this was possible. Hour four, my hands are cold. David calls for a break, and I ask to slip on my mittens. They will not fit over the wool gloves, so I take them off and stick them back in my jacket. On go the mittens. Better, but still my hands are cold. Suddenly we get a report from the back that Greg is not well. He is ill with severe headaches and nausea and dizziness. The porters help him. Greg had not been able to take Dymox for altitude sickness because he is a flight crew member, and he was not allowed to take these medicines. And so he is now feeling extreme altitude sickness. He wants to quit. Lisa and Emma tell him not now. David shuffles us, picks Greg up, and says he is now first in line behind David. Then Martin, still breathing hard. Then Emma, Nolan behind Daddy. Then Dan, then Lisa. Lisa, always the strongest, still at the rear. Greg and Martin's packs are with the Porter Africans and the guide, good luck. Mike, the assistant guide, is behind us. Back on the trail, it's even a steeper climb. Zigzag left, climb six feet, turn right. Zigzag right, climb six feet, repeat. I look back and estimate 200, 250 headlamps close behind us, with even more way behind us, uh, just be getting their scent up the mountains. I also now know where the east is because the sky is getting light. David says we cannot stop. We must go up. By hour five, Greg is very sick and getting worse. We take a break. My hands are cold. I get my bag and drop my battery warmers in. It's hard to switch them on. We're back on the trail. My hands are cold still and tingling. I figure it's altitude sickness, but they hurt and it seemed to be going numb. David takes a quick break for Greg, and it does not feel like my hand warmers are working, so I loosen my mitten straps to check them. Too late. We're climbing again. And, uh, however, I'm feeling my fingers again and can move them, and it turns out my mitten straps are too tight, and that's what was causing all the numbness. I found out later that my left-hand battery never got turned on anyways. I had turned on the right one and felt it working, though the bulkiness interfered with my poles. I probably... Well, I did yell at myself at that point and said I should have practiced this three days ago. By hour six, we're nearing Stella Point, and this picture that's still up is kind of close to Stella Point. Um, I'm feeling pretty good. Greg is not. Martin's breathing hard, and it's getting lighter, but it's terribly cold as we hit the twilight. My head is hurting and throbbing, and I still have my headlamp on. Suddenly, I remember something David had said to me, for all of us, don't have your headlamp strap too tight. It'll give you a headache. Since it's lighter now and I can see and be seen without the headlamp, I take it off and stick it in my pocket. And instantly my headache goes away. That problem is solved. We make it to Stella Point and it's supposed to be the breaking point for many hikers. But they're just too tired and too sick to continue. Most climbers, however, that were there were not sick, but a few were and were ready to retreat back the mountain. We saw rangers taking care of a few of extremely sick clapper, uh, climbers, a couple who obviously had pulmonary or cerebral edemas who were being rushed by porters back down the mountain. They would have to go down 6,000 feet, a couple of thousand feet below Barafu Camp in order to be picked up by a helicopter. Still, a point was crowded. This is where everyone stops to rest, and this is where we have to decide whether we're going to go on up. Nolan and the guides get Martin some hot water, who gets the breathing better, and David feeds Greg some chocolate that Greg had given David the day before. Greg spits it out. We refuse to let him quit, and we pick him up. I ask Martin about some old football plays to make sure he's good. He remembers those old plays, and we step back on the mountain. Stella Point is 57, 57 56 meters, about almost 19,000 feet high. The sign says 18,885. I'm feeling pretty good. My hands are no longer tingling and my feet feel fine. I seem to be breathing well and I'm eager to keep going to the summit. I get my phone out to snap a selfie. When I look back now at this selfie, I think maybe I wasn't in as good a condition as I thought. Emma is doing well. It's still a point, obviously quite happy to be here, although she tells me later that she was absolutely freezing. We hear David's usual rise up, Team Simba, and it's time to get going to the summit. 
We reassemble our line, and Lisa and I are holding on to Greg, who we've convinced must continue to the summit. We round the curve after Stella Point, go about 1,000, 100 feet, and suddenly the whole world like this opens up in front of us. Instead of the final 300 feet being a rocky, slippery climb, the path opens up, and we will simply be walking in a dirt path in a gaggle towards the final summit. You can see the peak right there, and it's a short distance away around the rim of the volcano's crater. It's a huge relief, and all of us feel it. And David has to remind us to poly poly, go slow, lest we overdo it. He's been here before, and he knows what the lack of oxygen will do to us if we start hurrying. It's about 7 a.m. now, and it takes us another 30 minutes to get to the peak. We made it. This is Uhuru Peak. We've been climbing for seven and a half hours at this point. Team Simba assembles at the summit sign. In the front are Emma and Greg. Martin is behind Emma, and Nolan is behind Martin. Lisa's arm is outstretched, and I am standing on the far right. We are at the top of the world, or at least the top of Africa. Emma and Mike, our guys, have our cameras and are snapping the pictures. Here's a group picture with the, the porters and the guys that are with us. All on top, another guy from another group had taken this picture. Our guy, Good Luck, is in the front, carrying my pack, of course, as he usually did. And you can see all of us there celebrating our accomplishment and making it to the top. I did snap this picture of Lisa at the summit. She was the strongest hiker of us all and thoroughly enjoyed her time there. My text to her mom that night when I sent this photo was, Lisa, strong like animal. We did make Greg pose for a picture. He was still quite sick with altitude sickness and he and Nolan would begin descending very quickly. Greg was going to do a neat panorama picture of the summit, and he planted the French flag, but he was just not up to doing it by the time he was there. Here's a picture of the glacial wall below us. I wanted to hike down there and touch it. It seemed so close. David the guide, however, smiled and wisely said no. Over the last 100 years, nearly 90% of the glaciers and the snow on top of Mount Kilimanjaro has melted away. Here's a picture of Mowensi Peak off to the east from the summit. And here's a view towards the city of Arusha. And as you can see, the clouds are completely coming scenery below us. And the sun is now directly across from us. As you can see, the shadows extending straight out. No one makes the announcement that his young brain cells are dying by the minute up here. And he, Greg, Lisa and Emma begin their descent. Martin and I take a moment to spend one last minute on the summit of the mountain before our descent. Dave will take Martin and I a different way down the mountain towards the backside. It will take us longer, but it's not as steep. It will be a little easier on our knees. The others are going to go back down the same way we came up. Lisa snapped this picture of Nolan on the way down. And by now, Greg is feeling a whole lot better. And more oxygen is obviously available further down the mountain. Lisa, Emma, Greg, and Nolan get back about three hours after we're at the summit. Martin and I take five hours, more than five hours, to get back down. By this time, the sun is blazing hot, and I'm dressed for the cold, and I also forgot to have any sunscreen or lip, lip balm. So the sun is really beating at me. Fortunately, the porters have a few extra mango juice cartons and uh, are able to keep us nourished on the way down the hill. My text home that night was, Team Simba made it. All six of us saw the sunrise on the Huro Peak at 19,341 feet. The view of Africa below us was wonderful, but we had to imagine it as the sun shined over the clouds below us all around. Seven-hour midnight climb, five hours back down, freezing cold. Then I said, what was I thinking? Then it was glorious, and I am exhausted. We were supposed to take a quick break and climb further back down the mountain to get towards better oxygen levels. We just did not have time to get all the way down to Millennium Camp before dark, so we stopped at high camp, 3,950 meters, or 12,960 feet. So again, we're back below the level of Pikes Peak. Oxygen is plentiful here, and we all feel much better. We are 6,400 feet lower than we were at the summit, 
in the morning. The next day will be a long walk as we have to travel about eight miles to get to the Mojave Gate at the bottom. We pack up. This is our last pack out. In the morning, we're headed out. We break our camp for the last time and begin our walk down the mountain. And this was the only rainy day we had. And it was a nice wet one. Uh, by this time, we make the movement. We could camp in a couple of hours, another 2,800 feet down. The hike was slow given the slippery nature of the trail, but after seven more hours, we do make it down to Moeka Gate. And here, David checks us in, and the rangers on Kilimanjaro prepare our certificates. Each of us were given a gold certificate to certify that we had made it to a little peak, the highest point in Africa. Smoking wet, we caught our bus and made the three-hour trip back to our hotel. That night, we had arranged on the mountain that we were so pleased with our guides that we treated them to a meal of roasted goat. We were so impressed with our team and so happy they had taken all six of us to the summit and got back down again safely. We had a great night to celebrate, drink a few local beers, and toast one another. And even better, January, our cook, who had been evacuated off the mountain a few days earlier, was able to join us for that evening, recovering from his appendicitis operation. I want to talk a little bit about what it would cost. I won't go into a lot of details, but um, basically, the tour company itself, the climb, and the two nights we spent in a hotel prior to going, and the night we spent in the hotel after the mountain cost us $2,600. You had $50 for the toilet, $100 for a Tanzanian visa, and about $2,000 for the flight, depending on your airline and your travel schedule. We also bought emergency medical evacuation insurance, which I would highly recommend. The cost for me for a million-dollar evacuation plan was $340. If you're younger, you're going to pay about $100 to $150 less. And usually, it's recommended on a trip like this, you would tip $250 to $300 to the porters. We were so impressed with them that we voted to double our tip to $600 from each of us uh, because we thought they were just such an astonishingly uh, well-led and well-disciplined team and all friendly. So we doubled our tip for them. The safari itself, which I didn't really talk about on this trip, was another four days after this, cost an additional $1,300. And if you do go, of course, you're going to have to spend some money on good gear and boots. And if you don't already have one, I would expect to spend anywhere between $1,500 to $3,000 on clothes and gear. So altogether, the Kilimanjaro journey costs about $5,500, plus the safari costs of $1,300, plus any clothes or gear that you have to buy that you don't have. As a comparison, the month before, my wife and I had taken a 10-day um, Mediterranean cruise, and we traveled to Venice, Italy, to, to catch the ship. We had three extra nights in Venice, and this actually cost us total about $6,500 each. So roughly about the same as the trip up the mountain and the safari. I would like to say, um, you know, REI is a good store to buy in, but so is Dick's Sporting Goods. And obviously, the best thing to do is look for sales on the kind of clothing and gear that you need. Now, here's some contact information. Uh, there are many companies besides these. Uh, Emma used uh, Climbing Kilimanjaro, and uh, we really liked the results of that. And the Climbing Kilimanjaro set the whole thing up, including the uh, working with Tanzania Wildlife Safaris. All we really had to do was to get our visas, set up our flights, and get the medical uh, evacuation insurance. The, literally, the, the tour company did everything else. Hidden Valley Safaris was actually the tour guide that our porters and our head guide, David, belonged to. And if you'd like uh, further information or some more detailed stuff, uh, please email Martha at the Prince William County Library, and her, uh, her email is shown here. And some final thoughts, um, you can climb Kilimanjaro. We did it. Um, I was 62. Uh, I wasn't in the best of shape, but with the outstanding uh, leader and David and the porters, 
uh, they got us up that mountain, and we just cannot say enough good about them and David's leadership. Poli poli, uh, go slow is obviously the way to succeed. And um, I, I'd say the food was fantastic. There was it was always warm. There was tasty and plenty of it. Uh, anyone can make this journey. We were passed by young, I call them Vikings, and they walked swiftly past us one day, and I made a comment, like, ah, see, the guys are like Vikings, and the guy stopped, turned around, said, of course, we are from Norway, uh, but we passed groups that were slower than us, and uh, it's all about taking your time and, and making your pace to get up that mountain, but I would recommend if you're there, do take a safari, take advantage of that opportunity of visiting Tanzania to uh, to see some of the sites, and that's really the the end of the briefing, I'll open it up for questions. I don't know if there's any chats or um, – and I'll just spin through while I'm seeing if anybody has anything. Let me click back to my briefing. It took us about half a day to drive to the safari uh, areas, um, and I just have a few pictures. I will say that my phone camera just wasn't going to live up to this, so Lisa and Emma had the big phones. And these are really their pictures, so credit goes to them. Um, I would say that if you're going to take a safari, do take a good camera or take Lisa and Emma back with you to take the pictures while you're uh, enjoying it. We uh, rode around in a Toyota um, or a Land Rover whose top would come off and uh, had a nice refrigerator in it to keep our beer cold. And we could just sit in the comfort of the vehicle and look at the uh, as animals as we went through. And our guide worked with other guides there on the radio to find out where the animals were that day and would take us to those spots. Um, a leopard, obviously, of the big, um, you can see five of the big six animals in Tanzania. You cannot see the gorillas in Tanzania. You have to go to Rwanda or Uganda for that. But we did see everything except the white rhinoceros or the black rhinoceros. Um, zebras were everywhere. And you could get very, very close to them. A little hyena, a good picture from Lisa here, a uh, relaxing hyena. They look a whole lot friendlier, I guess, than their reputation. Elephants, we saw a lot of elephants, and uh, we actually stood by for an hour and watched a whole herd of elephants uh, make their way across the plain. Here, a selfie at the, the entry of Serengeti National Park. You can see we're looking a whole lot better than we were a couple days ago on the mountain. And giraffes, you can see giraffes at the base of Kilimanjaro around the city of Arusha. And as we were driving to the beginner climb, there were giraffes everywhere along the base of the mountain. But obviously in the Serengeti as well, uh, there were quite a few giraffes, and we had the opportunity to get up close. Here's a good uh, picture of a hippo pool. The only thing I would say is uh, don't get too close because of the stink, and please do not drink the water in this little hippo pool. Here's a view of the Angora and Gold Crater, and uh, that was our, our third or the third long day in the in Safari. All the animals go there to get the fresh water at the, at the middle of the crater, and it really was a, a beautiful day to look at uh, the animals of Africa. And with that, I'll conclude and hope uh, hope you all enjoyed this presentation. Any questions? Thanks, Dan. That was great. Yeah, it was awesome. Thank everybody for joining. And, uh, if anybody needs any further information, drop it out or get a hold of me, and we'll, uh, I'll be glad to get you. Files Say what, Dwight? Martha, did she get off? Oh, there she is. You should be able to see a few files that we posted for equipment or anything like that, but load them on your machine. Hey, Dan, this is Dwight. Thank you for the great presentation. That was wonderful. Well, thanks for joining us, Dwight. They had a good turnout. I mean, I realize a lot of them were friends of theirs, but that's that's pretty good. 
Yeah. Okay. Okay. On. Let's no, go. You sure? Why don't you go on? Okay. Introduce yourself. Do you remember this guy, Dan? Yeah. He was like the boss. <laughs> okay, I'm going to back out. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing the video here. Hey, hello. Can you hear us? Yes. yes. Okay, this is, I'm Preston Mullen. My wife I'm is Elaine. Elaine. You remember Elaine Marsh? Yes. A few years ago. So that's yeah. great. Well, thank you. Um, 